Tonight, a fresh budget battle. We need the wall and it has to be built. Over a well-worn promise is heating up on Capitol Hill. With Democrats warning of another government shutdown. It is exciting to be here. Democrats hit the campaign trail across the country in spring training for 2020. Donald Trump must be defeated. Plus defining the enemy and sharpening their message. All this as the crisis in Venezuela spins out of control on Fake Nation. Budget blowback over the president's 2020 spending proposals. Welcome to Faith Nation. I'm John Jessup. And I'm Jenna Browder. Well, President Trump's 2020 budget unveiled earlier today aims to cut spending by $2.7 trillion and erase the deficit in 15 years. He also wants billions more for the border. Oh, yeah, but if the past is any indication, that request isn't going anywhere in the Democrat-controlled House. For more on how lawmakers are responding to the White House's proposal, we turn to Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson. Abigail? Well, that's right, Jenna. President Trump is certainly not giving up the fight to fund the wall, asking Congress on Monday for another $8.6 billion for a 722-mile-long physical barrier along the southern border. We need the wall, and it has to be built, and we want to build it fast. In a unified rejection, Democrat House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer Warn this could lead to another government shutdown, saying Congress refused to fund his wall and he was forced to admit defeat and reopen the government. The same thing will repeat itself. We hope he learned his lesson, but the White House thinks the fight is worth it. President Trump still wants about $8 billion from last month's emergency declaration after Congress gave him less than two for a physical barrier but he faces legal challenges on accessing that money. I would just say that the whole issue of the wall and border security is of paramount importance. We have a crisis down there. I think the president has made that case very effectively. White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow told Fox News cutting spending is another key element in this budget. And the president is proposing um, roughly a 5% across the board reduction in domestic spending accounts. It will be a tough budget. We're going to do our own caps this year, and I think it's long overdue. Some of these recent budget deals have not been favorable towards uh, spending. The White House says this proposal makes reining in reckless Washington spending and returning to fiscal sanity a major priority. Well, I hate to tell you, but it is headed to $23 trillion. Neither party seems to be able to do anything to stop this inexorable uh, crisis of national debt. Stephen Moore, a former Trump economic advisor, believes nothing short of a war on wasteful spending will change the tide. Well, there's always a uh, what we call fourth quarter spending, where agencies, if they haven't spent all the money they were allocated by Congress, they furiously try to spend money on it. It doesn't even matter what they spend it on. Uh, you know, the money just flows out the door. Moore says one way to change that would be to offer incentives, maybe some bonus to lawmakers finding ways to cut spending. The problem is the incentives in Washington are to increase your spending because that's how you get a budget increase the next year. That's one of the reasons why the U.S. federal debt reached $22 trillion and is still growing. So Congress and the president should insist that in exchange for raising that debt ceiling, we have spending cuts that make sure we're not going to $30 trillion over the next decade. The country continues to add billions in debt each day. Just last week, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin asked Congress to raise the federal debt ceiling ASAP. Now the Treasury Department is on track to run out of money to pay the nation's bills by the end of September unless Congress takes action and raises the debt ceiling. Abigail, what happens next with the budget? Well, this budget in the Democrat-controlled House, it's not likely to go anywhere. This is a chance for the White House and President Trump to lay out his priorities and what he, where he would like to see money allocated and money go. But Congress does not have to adhere to this. And as we heard, Pelosi and Schumer certainly did not give this positive reviews. Other Democrats have called it a fantasy document. So now Congress will come up with their own 2020 budget, which presumably will look quite different to what the White House laid out today.
Abigail, is this setting the stage for another possible shutdown come September? Oh, certainly. Uh, many Democrat lawmakers are saying that this is this is showing that we could probably face another government shutdown in September. Now, as we know, last fall, when President Trump laid out how much money he wanted to see for the wall, which Congress did not give him, that then led to the longest government shutdown in American history. And now President Trump is asking for even more money than before, $8.6 billion. And Democrat lawmakers have, not to my knowledge, changed their stance on building that physical barrier in the past few weeks. So I think that we certainly could see another government shutdown come September. Abigail, we know the House passed a resolution opposing the president's declaration on a national emergency on the U.S.-Mexico border. Where does that stand now? Well, the Senate is going to have to vote on that resolution by Friday because it's what's called a privilege res resolution. So while Republican leadership in the Senate does not necessarily want to bring this to the floor, they have to because of the rules of Congress. Now, we are hearing that as many as 15 Republican senators could vote with their Democrat colleagues of rebuking President Trump's national emergency declaration. And this is not these are Republicans who don't necessarily they're not necessarily against border security and building a border wall, but they're concerned with just the precedent that this sets and the overreach of executive power, so they don't necessarily approve of the, the method that President Trump took to get those funds for the border wall. Now, if it is as many as 15, maybe even a few more, that President Trump will likely, almost certainly, veto this resolution when it hits his desk, and that 15 is still not enough to, for, to override that veto in the Senate. So, but it, it is likely going to be a, a very embarrassing vote for, for the White House at the end of this week. Abigail Robertson reporting on Capitol Hill. Thanks, Abby. Thanks. Well, to the 2020 presidential election, spring training is in full swing. Democrats hit the campaign trail across the country this weekend, sharpening their message and defining their enemy. Gotta run like there's nothing to lose. He's not talking 2020 just yet, and although he lost the 2018 Texas Senate race, Beto O'Rourke remained front and center this weekend. What if we ran for Senate? With the premiere of an HBO film documenting his exciting but unsuccessful run. By beating Donald Trump, and that is the highest purpose that I have right now. Democrats answering that call say they have one goal. Donald Trump must be defeated. Candidates for the 2020 nomination spread out across the country this weekend, announcing policies ranging from the radical. It looks like we're ready for a political revolution. To the mundane. We need to reshape Washington. I want us to, in a really good way, and maybe this is a Pollyanna, just be able to discuss policy differences. Hello, Long Island City! In New York, Senator Elizabeth Warren pitched legislation to break up tech giants like Amazon and Facebook. We have these giant tech companies that think they rule the earth. It is time to break up America's tech giants. His interpretation of scripture is pretty different from mine to begin with. And at a CNN-sponsored town hall at the South by Southwest Festival, a hardline. My understanding of scripture is that it is about protecting the stranger and the prisoner and the poor person and that idea of welcome. That's, that's what I get in the gospel when, when I'm in church. From the first openly gay Democratic presidential candidate depicting the vice president's faith. His has a lot more to do with, with sexuality and uh, I don't know, a certain view of rectitude. 37-year-old mayor Pete Buttigieg used Pence's loyalty as a backhanded swing at his boss. How could he allow himself to become the, the cheerleader of the porn star presidency? Is it, that he, is it that he stopped believing in scripture when he started believing in Donald Trump? I don't know. I don't know. And the Democrats today announced Milwaukee as the site of the 2020 Democratic National Convention, choosing to nominate their challenger to President Trump in the battleground state of Wisconsin. And CBN News Chief Political Analyst David Brody joins us now to break down their strategy. And uh, David, first of all, to this uh, first bit of news, why Milwaukee? 
because they're going for blue collar Democrats. I mean, we talked about that. Is it going to be the Biden? Do they want to win back the Trump voters in those blue collar states or they want to go think about it? Miami and Houston, right? Texas and, and uh, Florida and minorities. It doesn't, didn't seem like they were going that way. I, I thought it's an interesting choice. Makes sense. Uh, Hillary Clinton uh, lost to Donald Trump by less than 1% in Wisconsin, 20,000 votes. And so here come Democrats. They're back yeah. in 2020. A targeted choice. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the Democrats, it looks like they're forming into diverging lanes here. Yeah, no, they're for sure. So there's Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders in the socialist lane, and then there's um, Amy Klobuchar uh, and a few others in that pragmatic lane. John Hickenlooper would be one of them. Uh, and then there's kind of like the undecided lane right now. You know, where does uh, Kamala Harris really fit exactly? Where does Cory Booker fit? I think that's going to be interesting to watch out. But everybody's choosing their lane, but there's a socialism strain in every one of those lanes. It's interesting. For sure. The people that you just noted with uh, mm -hmm. Elizabeth Warren and Kamala mm -hmm. Harris, both of them went on the record saying that they weren't socialists. I think they're trying to like veer away from that Bernie Sanders lane. For sure. And Julian Castro actually, when asked socialism or capitalism, he quickly said capitalism. So good answer. Mm -hmm. Good mm -hmm. answer. Uh, David, Democrats are talking a lot about this moment that the president had over the weekend. He was in Alabama touring the storm damage and some people there asked him to sign their Bibles, so he did it. Uh, but they are they are tearing into him. Make, what, what do you make of this? Well, the media is, but look, uh, there are some folks that don't feel comfortable, obviously, uh, with anybody signing a Bible or having any sort of uh, extracurricular writing <laughs> inside God's Word. Uh, so that's understandable. But it made me think a little bit about how we've had a. Uh, a relationship with Donald Trump and the Bible and CBN because we've asked him these questions right. throughout the year. So shall we take a trip down memory lane? Let's do it. All right. Thank you for asking. 2011. <laughs> here we go. Donald Trump and the Bible. I understand a lot of people send you Bibles. Is that true? Well, I get sent Bibles by a lot of people. Where yes. are all those Bibles anyhow lot. now? <laughs> well, actually, we, we keep them in a certain place, a very, very nice place. But people send me Bibles. And, you know, it's very interesting. I get so much mail. And because like, you know, I'm in this incredible location in Manhattan. You can't keep most of the mail you get. There's no way I would ever do anything to do negative to a Bible. So what we do is we keep all of the Bibles. We just, I would have a fear of, of doing something other than very positive. So actually I store them and keep them and sometimes give them away to other people. I have my Bible and I thought I'd bring it and it was, written, this was written by my mother, and it says, presented to Donald Trump on his graduation from the primary department by the Sunday Church School of First Presbyterian Church, Jamaica, New York. And it's amazing, and uh, all written out sort of like, uh, so that I always know it's mine. But it was special, and I, I open it and I look at that a lot. Actually, it's an incredible book. So many things you can learn from the Bible and you can lead your life. And I'm not just talking in terms of religion. I'm talking in terms of leading a life mm -hmm. even beyond a religion. There's so many brilliant things in the Bible. And you can read it over, and many people have done this and they've led their life that way, but you can read it hundreds and hundreds of times. You know, David, they say great art, like the Mona Lisa. Some people, they look at it and it doesn't look as great at the beginning. And then they'll look at it. By the time they see it many, many times, it becomes the most. They can't take their eyes off it. Mm -hmm. Whereas art that's not great, you look at it, it looks beautiful at the beginning, but you don't, you get tired of it. The Bible is special. The Bible, the more you see it, the more you read it, the more incredible it is and the more you realize. It's like a great, you, you could say, I mean, I don't like to use this analogy, mm -hmm. but like a great movie, a great, incredible movie. Mm -hmm. You'll see it once, it'll be good. You'll see it again. You can see it 20 times, and every time you'll appreciate it more. The Bible is the most special thing. I'm still trying to figure out if he said incredible movie or credible movie. I don't know, but either way, I was distracted by the hat and the sneakers. Good look for uh, Mr. Make America Great Again. Nice trip down memory lane. Thank you, sir. Thanks, David. All right. Well, when we come back, an expert and former State Department official's perspective on Venezuela and coming up with the right policy as the country spins out of control. It seems we've been left alone. The law states that no person shall convert any person from one religious faith to another. Who is he? And yet not one missionary has been charged. Graham Staines, nice to properly meet you. You bring me evidence of illegal conversion by Graham Staines. I'll give you a permanent position. 
Need new floors? Empire today makes getting beautiful new floors easy. Impossible? Let me show you. Empire brings hundreds of samples to you. We call it shop at home. The floors are high quality and come with great warranties. Plus, Empire handles the installation. You don't lift a finger and the job's done right. Shop at home, quality floors, professional installation. That's Empire today. Get $250 off new floors. Call the special number on your screen now. Attention. If you currently do not get health insurance through your employer, or if you do not have health insurance, or if you just got divorced or married, had a baby, moved, or lost your health insurance coverage, listen closely. You are eligible for a new health care plan using Health Insurance America. A family of four can make up to $97,000 a year and still qualify for a new health care plan. Get coverage for doctor visits, prescriptions, hospital, dental, and vision for as little as $25 a week with co-pays as low as zero dollars health insurance rates have nearly doubled in the last three years stop paying the rising cost of traditional major medical and learn how health insurance america is saving people thousands of dollars a year on their health care plans don't waste hours on the phone or on a government website talk to a live health care consultant right now call 1-800-940-5020 that's 1-800-940-5020 1-800-940-5020 Welcome back. American experts are on the way to Africa to assist with the investigation into that Ethiopian Airlines plane crash. Teams from the Federal Aviation Administration and National Transportation Safety Board should arrive by Tuesday. Meanwhile, authorities are still sifting through the crash site to identify the victims. All 157 people on board died, including eight Americans and at least 21 United Nations workers. China, Indonesia, and Ethiopia have all grounded their fleet of Boeing 737 MAX 8 planes in the wake of Sunday's crash, just four months after another deadly 737 accident in Indonesia. Well, trouble continues tonight in the divided country of Venezuela. Five days of blackouts have resulted in protests, looting, and a crisis at local hospitals. Here's Amber Strong. The country of Venezuela is in the dark, its power grid failing, as an ongoing power struggle rocks the nation. It's been five days since the city of Caracas went black. Worsening an already devastating humanitarian crisis, food is already scarce. No power means no refrigeration. We are very sad because our food is being spoiled and we have to buy strategically. Local hospitals are running on generators. His father stands in line to collect water from the river mountain. I have my family, my wife, I have to go out looking. I'm not here because I want to be. Opposition leader Juan Guaido claims 17 have died as a result of the blackout. He's placing the blame squarely at the feet of leader Nicolas Maduro and urging the Venezuela military to intervene. High Command, will you continue hiding the dictator when you know a viable solution is not possible with him? But Maduro says the prolonged blackouts are a result of a U.S. cyber attack. The macabre strategy of this attack on the electrical system is to take our people to a level of despair. The socialist country has been in a downward economic spiral for years. Venezuela's National Assembly voted Guaido the country's leader, claiming Maduro stole the recent elections. National Security Advisor John Bolton believes the tide is turning for the U.S.-backed Guaido. I think momentum is on Guaido's side. Uh, reports in the press that uh, stress the military hasn't shifted missed the point entirely. They have not st uh, sought to arrest Guaido and the National Assembly and the opposition. And I think one reason for that is that Maduro fears if he gave that order, it would not be obeyed. Last week, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo tweeted, no food, no medicine, now no power, next no Maduro. But so far, there's been no official word of U.S. military intervention. Amber Strong, CBN News in Washington. Thanks, Amber. Well, James Roberts with the Heritage Foundation is a former State Department diplomat and joins us now for more. All right, James, good to see you. Uh, first question, uh, what do you make the United States' is handling of Venezuela? It sort of seems like it's a wait-and-see kind of approach for now. I think the Trump administration has really been calling this one right from the start. And this is really a, a mass movement led by Venezuelan people who are suffering uh, the worst uh, humanitarian crisis in the history of Latin America now. Three million people have already fled. Millions more want to, as your report said. People are dying in hospitals, little babies in neonatal units. Uh, dialysis patients are dying by the dozens. 
Uh, people don't even have water. There are no, like, not, no electricity to pump the water uh, or the fuel. Most of the gas stations are closed. This is a tremendous uh, humanitarian catastrophe, one that the Heritage Foundation predicted in our annual uh, Heritage Foundation Index of Economic Freedom at heritage.org slash index. We've been showing that economic freedom in Venezuela has been viciously repressed at the bottom of the world for 15 years by a basically criminal enterprise that's masquerading as a government, the Maduro crime family, under a basically a Cuban dictatorship in that country. And now the only countries in the world that are still backing the Maduro government are, are China and Russia. But 50, more than 50 countries have recognized Guaido as the legitimate president. And I think the United States is, is playing this very well. Certainly, we don't want to see American troops or other foreign troops go into Venezuela. We want the Venezuelans to force this, uh, this crime family out of the country and have the legitimate president come in and reestablish order and take steps to reestablish the economy. J James, I think the question on so many people's minds is how long can this go on and is there anything that the United States can do to force Nicolas Maduro out of power? Well, this, is, this can't go on much longer at this rate because this is a complete collapse of society and people have been talking about this for years, but this now is actually happening. No power because the, the Maduro and Chavez crime families stole more than $300 billion. They didn't put money into keeping up the electrical grid. It failed, and uh, now there's no power, and without power, a modern society can't function. Of course, there's no internet, there's no refrigeration, there's no, very little light, very few generators. Uh, so uh, the push has come to shove. The United States has been leading a humanitarian aid effort, uh, and the, of course, the Maduro government, uh, uh, backed by their Chinese and Russian you know, counterparts, have been resisting that because they know that that's going to be the beginning of the end for them. But that's what has to happen. Uh, we may even be talking about maybe some international humanitarian flights in to medevac some of these patients out who are dying. Uh, but this is going to continue. The pressure from the presidents of, Ven of uh, Brazil and Colombia are especially important in this matter. The United States is just one of many countries that is insisting that the rule of law be reestablished and that these criminals James, get, get out. Real quickly yes. here, so President Trump has made it clear he doesn't like endless wars, he doesn't like these protracted involvements, but uh, Vice President Pence says the administration has no timetable on the Venezuelan policy, so what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that they have, they've left all options on the table, and I think that's, that's correct. But, but certainly you want this effort to come from the Venezuelan military. You want to have a majority of those officers and troops decide that they want to be for the future of their country and not continue to support these criminals who are in power. And, and that's really going to be the, the thing that will turn, the, turn this thing around and then also have a force on the ground after Maduro's gone that can uh, maintain and reestablish order. So external uh, military intervention is not going to be the long-term solution. And I think uh, the, the Trump All administration right, knows that. All right, James Roberts with the Heritage Foundation. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, Democrats and Republicans at teeterhooks, tenterhooks over the budget, immigration, and the next presidential election. Up next, though, how some are finding common ground on the issue of religious freedom. First ROTC graduate student. Well, you may find this hard to believe, but in Washington, there's a group of Democrats and Republicans coming together to shine a light on religious persecution around the world. And Jennifer Wishon introduces us to one woman who believes the group's efforts are making all the difference. Even in a city as divided as Washington, people of different faiths and different politics are coming together to help their persecuted brothers and sisters. When you see people in other countries that literally are willing to die rather than to uh, renounce what they believe, certainly gives you a different perspective 
on life. Gail Manchin is an educator, and as the wife of West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, she's seen up close many of the problems facing Americans. But last spring, her eyes were open to global religious persecution when she joined the U.S. Commission for International Religious Freedom. Were you surprised at, at what a huge issue this is globally? Yes, because even though I had, I guess, an awareness, uh, had no idea the extent uh, of abuse and violation to for human rights as well as religious beliefs. Made up of nine members spanning the ideological spectrum, the commission represents different faiths and traditions. And one of the things that you do is you have a prisoner of conscience program. Tell me about that. We found that if you can put a face to an issue, how much uh, more uh, it resounds with the public and, and people get the message better. Case in point, Andrew day. Brunson, the pastor because recently freed after spending two years in a Turkish prison. A commissioner adopted well, Brunson, visited him while captive, and applied pressure on Turkey to release him. Tell me about the folks you've adopted. Both are from Iran. Mr. Tahiri is a writer. He was on, had been taken from prison, was retried and put on death row. And then just recently, was taken back out and taken off death row, but his sentence has been extended for five more years. Do we hope that perhaps him being a prisoner of conscience helped raise the awareness and took him off death row? We, we don't know, but we certainly hope so. Uh, my other uh, uh, prisoner is a woman, Golrock Irahe. She was writing about the injustice of women being stoned for, cre for committing adultery. And for that, um, she was arrested for breaking Islamic sanctities. Her writings were not even published. They came into her home and confiscated writings and found this and used that against her. Manchin has learned from Arahi's sister that this attention from America makes a difference. What I have found in serving on this commission and traveling to other countries, they care about what the United States thinks of them. And the fact that we bring out these uh, violations and discriminations you know, gives them pause, I believe. But it takes patience. Nine prisoners of conscience have been released, yet the overall situation grows more serious with each passing day. It is a commitment and dedication to a, a large issue, a global issue that is not getting better, unfortunately. Uh, it seems like that in many of the countries that we are watching, uh, it, the conditions are deteriorating, not getting better, and so we cannot let up. The U.S. promotes religious freedom around the world because countries that allow its people to worship freely tend to be friendly neighbors. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Thank you, Jennifer. You know, it, it's so true. You can't have religious freedom if you don't have religious freedom for everyone going to Jennifer's point there. That's very true, and I, I love the fact that they were able to highlight and show the faces and the names of the people who are under yeah. persecution. Yeah. Well, that'll do it for tonight's Faith Nation. Have a great evening. I was very